So Shemek, tell us how Dan uh, came to see you and then what you thought when you first evaluated his case. I saw Dan, who was referred to me as a patient with possible metastatic prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. He had a biopsy of the prostate um, based on elevated PSA of about, I want to say, 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and the biopsy was positive for cancer. And it was kind of what we would say intermediate risk prostate right. cancer. didn't have a lot of aggressive feature on biopsy. <laughs> mm -hmm. However, he had um, uh, appropriately imaging tests performed, which included CAT scan, bone scan, and this new generation uh, right. PSMA PET scan, and they all focused on one area in the left fourth rib. They yeah. were all showing abnormality in the left fourth rib. Yeah, and, was and, and you wouldn't have expected him to have, with his biopsy and even his PSA uh, yes. above 10, you right. wouldn't think that he would have spread to the, to the ribs. Yes, this, this, was, this really. was surprising. However, yeah. the consistency of these findings, lack of any other explanation, he didn't recall any trauma to this area, right. were, were worrisome. So initially my thought was, well, unfortunately this may be one of these unusual cases where despite the relatively favorable biopsy pattern, uh, the cancer has spread to the bone and right. we have to treat it in such a way which really relies primarily on uh, hormonal therapy, drug therapy. But then we, uh, you know, we, we thought that this is the kind of case that we really should discuss more in our kind of multidisciplinary uh, conference. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I like to think that that's a real strength of, of our yeah. program in that um, we're not committed to anyone. It, we're not, uh, it's not a one size fits all. Right, so exactly. um, yeah. I think we like to examine, you know, what treatments fit that patient best, and I and I applaud you for it. I mean, you have these questions about, you know, does right. could he have right. metastatic disease spread to the rib? And it, it sure he could, yeah. but it didn't quite make sense. It didn't quite make sense. Usually, we would see other areas as well, and not just an isolated rib area. The one of the problems with this location of this possible abnormality is that it's very difficult to biopsy. Right. That would have been perhaps the way out of it to make the diagnosis by biopsy, but this is very challenging technically. A lot of the times we just don't get good sample. Yeah. So probably what needs to be done, if you really want to know for sure, is to take the whole rib out, which is a, a very morbid uh, thing to do. So ultimately we were beginning to st shift our thinking about this case and thinking that perhaps it, despite all these features, uh, because it didn't quite clinically make sense uh, that it may be a red herring or maybe a false positive result. And then we also thought that perhaps even if it's indeed small area of metastatic disease, there still may be a role for um, for going after the primary site uh, for well, the well, prostate. I mean, yeah. Well, certainly we know that there's data from studies like Stampede that even in men that have um, spread to bone uh, with limited spread, yeah. that you can treat the prostate, the, the primary, primary um, yeah. the prostate with radiation and then also hormones and have a generally a good result. So, yes. and, and there's emerging data, as you alluded to, that um, yeah. that maybe even surgery would be right. a good option to those men for a variety of reasons. It prevents right. uh, future spread of uh, cells from the prostate Yes. Um, it may help him avoid hormone therapy, potentially, depending on what yes. happens after surgery. And um, it uh, rids the body of cancer, and therefore, theoretically, the body may have um, more immune defenses against um, against what, what cancer is re remaining. Is it, yeah, do you agree yeah. with those principles, you think? I, I do. I think there's clearly a paradigm shift going on that in historically we would you know say that for any metastatic disease, uh, we would uh, not pursue local therapy, but that, that is changing for the reasons that, we meant, that you mentioned. You know, we've discussed this with him in quite a lot of details. Um, I, I think he really favored surgical option. And some patients yeah. really like the idea of the cancer being physically removed. Um, and we thought it was consistent with general principle that even if he had a small isolated uh, metastasis, uh, that makes sense and that's how we proceeded and he saw you and yeah uh, no, I think that's yeah, it, yeah. it is interesting that point you made that um, in my experience some some men that have prostate cancer um, 
you know, so I think, at least for me, as uh, an expert in localized prostate cancer, as a surgeon, it, there's never any benefit to me or the patient if I'm convincing someone to have surgery. But, um, you know, but some patients just feel better if the, if the primary but, cancer, yeah, if yeah. the prostate is out, out yeah. of their body. You yeah, know, some patients, yeah. some people are just like that. Yeah. So he happens to be one of those guys, so he felt more comfortable with surgery. Yeah. Surgery, of course, has uh, potential complications like, uh, you know, just the surgery itself, the anesthesia, uh, you know, yeah. potential yeah. Um, blood loss, um, and then the recovery. And most, the most feared things are like bladder, lack of bladder control or urinary incontinence mm -hmm. and erectile dysfunction. Um, so it's, uh, it's a big decision for men to want to proceed with prostatectomy. And, and I think we appreciate that here because we, we, yeah. we don't ever want to convince someone to proceed down that path if they aren't comfortable with it. You know, fortunately, I think it was the right decision for him. Yeah. Uh, clearly, um, based on his physical recovery, he did extremely well. And um, I mean, aside from, we'll talk, I mean, I'll let you, uh, you should comment about the, the, you know, the cancer part and the PSA and all that business, yeah. but, but physically he's done remarkably well. And, and when he told me after the fact, or I guess maybe it was right before surgery, well, you know, he had said he was a long distance open water swimmer, practices out here in, uh, off the coast of Santa Monica <laughs> and swims miles in the ocean. And yeah. he does an annual event in the Mediterranean with his buddies where they swim like 20 kilometers. I thought, yeah. well, that's nutty, of course. And I told him, you know, no, you can't swim 20 kilometers two weeks after surgery. And so I said, you can ride in the boat, but, but don't yeah. swim. And then as soon as he did it, he sent me a video right, of him right. swimming from Tuscany to the island of Elba. I told him the same, <laughs> but I, I kind of had a feeling that, that that's going to happen. And we, 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 we strongly recommended against this, but well, he had unfortunately, a very he's done recovery. extremely yeah, well. Yeah, and yeah. Um, his bladder control is good. Uh, and then, you know, his PSA well, so far so, is good. So this is, the, this is a quite a remarkable turn of events that after surgery, um, his PSA became undetectable, so below yeah. the level of detection, which really speaks um, for the fact that this, this rib lesion probably is not prostate cancer because usually that would release some PSA and that would be detectable. That would be our explanation, ex expectation. So even though there is still some uncertainty and obviously he will be followed very closely over a longer period of time, those first couple of PSAs actually had a second undetectable PSA yeah. afterwards. So that really is beginning to make us feel uh, perhaps a little bit more optimistic that indeed uh, this might have been uh, not a metastatic lesion, but some false positive. And, and at this point, we are not really necessarily planning any additional uh, drug therapy like we were thinking initially, but we'll just follow him very closely. Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting thing for me. I mean, you and I have worked together for a quarter of a century. Right, right. <laughs> so, Scary. you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, so what used to be, um, when we first started working together, if men, if we thought men had, you know, um, adverse features, aggressive disease, or any mm -hmm. indication that there was spread outside the prostate, we would immediately start them on some kind of um, adjuvant therapy or immediate therapy mm -hmm. after their surgery. Right. Now the, the data would indicate that it's safe to wait and use exactly. PSA as the indicator yes. um, as to when we treat when and, and, exactly, and, and pull yeah. the trigger for radiation or hormone therapy or so, you know, uh, tell me, tell me yeah, about that. Well, that, yes, that's exactly right. I think we really awaited uh, these studies that were completed within the last couple of years that actually looked very closely at that, uh, exactly that question, whether, whether we should go kind of proactively uh, in the post-surgical um, uh, setting to provide you know, additional therapy, radiation, uh, hormonal therapy, but it appears that the studies point in this direction that you mentioned, that in many cases it's uh, safe uh, and preferred to wait and use the PSA, which is very sensitive marker usually as a, as a kind of early indicator of uh, recurrence and intervene only uh, in that mm -hmm. kind of setting. So you really avoid over-treating many patients that perhaps don't need additional therapy and, and those other treatments that we uh, we could use, you know, they have their own problems, side effects. So if we can spare a lot of patients uh, those treatments without compromising outcomes, right. ultimately that's great. That's a great news. Yeah, I think that's um, one 
big step forward we've made. Whereas before, if and, and Dan, Dan didn't have these features on his pathology, but yeah. it would be that if we'd in the past, uh, 10 yeah. years ago or so, if we'd found a positive lymph node or if we'd found a positive margin, margin or yeah. if uh, seminal vesicles were involved, you know, a disease yeah. outside the prostate, we may have recommended early, you know, immediate, immediate or early treatment, hormone yeah. therapy and maybe even radiation. Yes. Um, now it's it's clear from the studies that have been done. This is the remarkable yeah, thing yeah. about multi-center trials. Right. Now we know it's safe to wait and just use yeah. PSA as the indicator. Right. Exactly. So Tim, from your perspective, how, how do you think Dan has done uh, post-operatively in terms of recovery from the uh, potential complications of surgery like bladder, uh, continency, ED issues? Mm -hmm. Well, he's clearly a better swimmer. You know, he's, he's, he's now, now he's, he's, he's lighter, you know, uh, less drag without yeah. the, no. So um, he's obviously a great swimmer and uh, the prostatectomies um, didn't seem to hurt him in that regard. You know, I think we appreciate as, as surgeons that um, with prostate cancer especially, uh, virtually all men that have prostate cancer that are going to have surgery come to me and they're symptom free. I mean, their bladder control is fine. They may have some trouble related to a large prostate like, you know, slow stream, getting mm -hmm. up at night, frequency of urination. But most men don't really have much in the way of symptoms. Uh, some men have natural erectile dysfunction prior to prostatectomy, but many do not. And nobody, uh, there aren't any gentlemen that um, would, would want to be incontinent of urine or have erectile dysfunction if they don't have it before surgery. Um, and so as the surgeon, you know, I, uh, this may sound odd, but essentially I can only make men worse. So the, 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 goal is, yeah. the, goal, the goal is to, if we are going to make them worse, hopefully that period of time that they're worse, like with incontinence, is, is minimized. Nice. Um, so what I've tried to do over the years is study surgical techniques that different surgeons have looked at from around the world, especially um, after robotics came to fruition 20, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. It allowed us to study little different aspects of prostatectomy and tweak those or test one against the other to see how we would, could improve outcomes. So now urinary incontinence, as in Dan's case, is typically very limited. So it used to be, right. the, used to be that men would go on for months or maybe never recover. Maybe the long-term serious incontinence rates were 15, 20%. Now it's really in our hands, it's, mm -hmm. it's about 1% of men might need a subsequent That's procedure okay. To fix a leaky bladder. That's not to say that it that it doesn't take some men some time. To, yeah, some time. It right. may take men several weeks, even a few months. But but uh, most guys, 85% of men have mm -hmm. really great bladder control within three months. Yeah. Uh, and at a year, it's a, it's in the high you know 98% or so. And yeah, I have to say that from my perspective, somebody who is not a surgeon and maybe I don't know the literature as as well as you do, of course, in that subject. But, but that, that is my impression too, when I see these patients that their continence recovery is, uh, is very, very good yeah. these days. So I think that's a testament to the improvement in surgical techniques that you know, your team and of course, you know, the, the worldwide you know, surgical community made. What about the ED? That seems to so, be a little bit slower, right? Yes, to recover. So, so ED is, is more difficult uh, subject and problem for a variety of reasons. Number one, um, measuring erectile dysfunction, quantifying it is difficult, right? Because it's, yeah. it's different for, for everybody. Um, it, it is important to know, and I tell this, I think as doctors we assume that people understand these things, but, but I, it's important for men to hear that if they have their prostate out, it doesn't change who they are as a sexual person, mm -hmm. you know, how, what their orientation is or how they think about sex. Right. Taking the prostate out doesn't affect their testosterone levels because exactly. it doesn't make testo it doesn't make uh, hormones and it's not so it doesn't affect their sex drive. Uh, taking the prostate out doesn't affect the sensation of the penis the way it feels to right. touch. Uh, taking the prostate out does not affect the ability to feel orgasm or climax. Um, that's a separate set of nerves. What what taking the prostate out does is cause erectile dysfunction or rigidity during arousal, so it can inhibit or prevent penetrative mm -hmm. intercourse. So um, what we're trying to do is minimize any nerve damage that 
of the nerves that sit alongside the base of the prostate so that they will recover more completely. And so the techniques have been developed to facilitate that and to improve that, but still it's less predictable. It is true, however, especially in men under 65, that if they have good erections before a prostatectomy, that with appropriate surgery, or the surgery done in what I would say with current techniques, and with other medical uh, management and other uh, treatments, um, somewhere around 85 to 90 percent of men will have return of natural erections with which they're able to have natural intercourse within a year. Hmm. But it, but it's typically slower than we would expect, for instance, with incontinence. With incontinence. Yeah. Does that include utilizing some medications like uh, yeah. Viagra? Yeah, so we're or, using, um, yeah. we, we have guys, uh, based on studies that have been done, we have men take a preoperative dose three days before surgery of either mm -hmm. generic Viagra or generic mm -hmm. Cialis. Mm -hmm. Um, cause there are studies to show that that helps mitigate some of the mm -hmm. shock to the nerves. And then we have them take daily, daily doses of, of the medication once the, about a week after surgery. Now there's a lot of misinformation about that. So many people, um, assume that, um, you know, if men take Viagra, they just immediately get an erection. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way it works. So the right. men have to be, Patient. as you know, they have, yeah. to be, they have to be aroused in some way and the nerves have to be functional. Right. So after surgery. The nerves are not really functional, they're in shock, mm -hmm. um, but, but taking daily Viagra or daily Cialis are, um, seem to help nerve recovery. And this has been shown in three different randomized mm -hmm. trials. So we use that, yeah. and then we use other, other techniques and treatments that help basically keep the penis healthy while the nerves are waking up. Yeah. That's yeah. The, kind of the whole That's philosophy. Kind of whole. So after a year, um, or let's say six months to a year, you know, many or majority of patients, right, who had uh, pretty normal or close to normal function in terms of bladder and sexual function, we would expect, you know, good recovery, yes. right? Yeah, 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 we would. Now, yeah. that's not to say that it's going to be as good as it was before surgery, but whereas, you know, years ago, we used to tell men to be patient, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it'll come back over time when, in fact, the longer you wait, uh, the worse it can be. So we like to be very proactive in right. this regard to, again, to kind of keep the penis healthy Mm -hmm. um, while the uh, while the nerves are kind of waking up or recovering from the shock.